Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Monday, December 5th, 2022. It is great to be back with David Anderson at long last. David, it's great to be with you again. Thanks so much for joining me. Sure, I'm glad to be here. Thanks. David, what I want to do today first is pick up on something really interesting that you said in our last discussion. You explained in great detail how you came to appreciate just how much better and efficient it would be to work with Drosophila over mice, that you could pursue the same research questions and do it in a way that was much more efficient and, 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 and constructive and, and even from a cost savings perspective. So the question there, it's sort of a fun historical question, and I don't mean to ask it cynically, but couldn't you have just paid attention to what T.H. Morgan and Sturdivant and all of those guys who came from Columbia's fly room a century ago, wouldn't they have been able to tell you about the value of Drosophila themselves? Um, so I didn't need T.H. Morgan. I had Seymour uh, asking me when I was going to see the light. Um, and, and, and so really, if I understand, you're asking why bother doing any experiments in mice? Why not just work on Drosophila? Unless uh, there's something specific about mice with your behavioral interests that you thought initially would be impossible to pursue in Drosophila. Uh, it's really a, uh, a, technical, uh, a technical difference. So uh, the two systems each have their strengths and weaknesses. And in, in the uh, 2000s, there were uh, a couple of technological breakthroughs, early to mid-2000s, <clears throat> that um, uh, actually put mice, in some respects, neural circuit research, as opposed to gene research, um, in, in mice a bit ahead of Drosophila. And um, I'll, I'll briefly say what they were. So in, in both systems, we were taking the approach of trying to choose, find a point of entry to aggression circuitry by artificially stimulating specific neurons and asking whether they promoted aggression or not, and if they did promote aggression, what features of aggression did they promote? And if they promoted aggression, were they also necessary for naturalistic aggression? And <clears throat> the, the way that when I say point of entry, what I mean is that if you, the idea is that if you start, you find a cell or cell population like that, you can build out the rest of the network by following the connections of those neurons. You can look sort of upstream at their inputs, and you can look downstream at their outputs and try to figure out what is different about what the inputs are doing and what are what is different about what the outputs are doing. And do that in a sort of iterative manner until you build up a pathway, basically. At least that was the thinking going into it. And the uh, advantage of Drosophila is that we could identify multiple points of entry uh, in an unbiased way by doing these, what I call forward cellular genetic screens, unbiased screens, where we take thousands of flies in each of which different neurons can be activated. And we turn on those neurons without even knowing in advance what those neurons are. And then finding the rare needles in the haystack where activation of those neurons uh, caused an increase in aggression, and then trying to narrow down those neurons and find their connections. And as I say, build out the circuit. So um, by uh, by, I, I would say we finished our first screen in doing that around 2011, 2012, which is right around the time that we uh, discovered aggression neurons in mice. And 
uh, the the problems that we ran into with Prosophila, the limitations that we ran into at that point were first a difficulty in actually mapping inputs and outputs to a particular group of neurons. And in other words, anatomical tracing. In uh, rodents, there are viruses, neurotropic viruses that you can inject that will be taken up by the terminals of inputs to a particular region and transported back. And so you can, that's called retrograde mapping, and you can find input cell populations. And conversely, there are anterograde tracing methods where you introduce a virus into the cell bodies of the neurons of interest and it moves forwards along their uh, uh, axons and you can see where they project. And uh, by in 2019, so, you know, these things take time, but in 2019, after having identified the estrogen receptor neurons in mice in 2014 as the ones that are controlling aggression in this ventromedial hypothalamic nucleus, um, by 2019, we had published a complete input output map uh, of for those that population of neurons. And to give you an idea of scale, we identified about 35 different inputs and 35 different outputs. And about 80% of the outputs are also inputs. So there's a huge amount of feedback in the system. We still have not done that for the aggression neurons that we discovered in flies because the viruses that you use to trace connectivity in mice cannot be applied in flies. They don't infect the neurons. It's too hard to inject them into a particular location. And uh, a, a, uh, a few efforts to try to do this tracing in other ways were made, but they really weren't uh, comprehensive and satisfactory. Now, that situation changed in 2020, 2021, with the publication of the first partial EM connectome of a fly brain, where basically you could just look up in the computer and find all of the connections inputs and outputs to any group of neurons and you could know the number of synapses and you could know the sign of the synapses. In fact, you can get much more detail information about connectivity from an electron microscope connectome than you can from the sort of viral tracing experiments that we can do in mice. However, that connectome's only been published so far for female flies. Don't ask me why. And a lot of the neurons we discovered in flies that control male aggression turn out to be male specific, not by design or construction in the screen, but they're male specific. And so we haven't really been able to use the female connectome to map their inputs and outputs. So it's now 2024, 10 years after we published our first paper on 2023, sorry, nine years after we published our first paper on aggression in Drosophila. Actually, I take that back. The first paper on aggression in Drosophila was 2008. So it's 15 years after. And we still don't have a complete input output map for the five or six different aggression neurons that we've identified in Drosophila. So that was kind of running up against a brick wall there. And then there's a second uh, very important um, difference that is uh, at the time um, in, in the mid 2000s, 2005 is when the first optogenetics paper was published. And that was demonstrated in worms, C. elegans, which are transparent, 
And it was demonstrated in mice by inserting fiber optic cables deep into the brain at the site where the light sensitive ion channel that is encoded by the channel rhodopsin 2 gene was genetically expressed. Um, but unfortunately, Drosophila was too small to insert a fiber optic cable in its head because the fiber optic cable is almost as big as the entire head. And uh, furthermore, it's not transparent. And uh, it's got a cuticle. And unfortunately, the first opsins that were developed, channel rod opsin 2, is activated with blue light, 477 nanometer light. And that light doesn't penetrate the cuticle of the fruit fly. So basically, for the first um, nine years of optogenetics, it could not be applied in fruit flies. That's I actually published the first paper on optogenetics applied to an adult fruit fly, but I was only manipulating cells in the antenna, uh, which are not covered by the same kind of cuticle that the head is. Uh, and it wasn't until 2014 when we and uh, a s independent group at MIT published on opsins that could be activated by red light in the 625 to 650 nanometer range that we could start to use optogenetics in fruit flies for activating neurons deep in the brain. And that's because the red light is not as absorbed or scattered as much by the cuticle as the blue light. And so it can penetrate into the brain of an intact fly. So the tools that we had for activating neurons in flies before optogenetics were temperature based, what we call thermogenetics. So we had ion channels, which we could turn on by raising the temperature, body temperature of the flies but from 23 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. And before optogenetics, that was a huge advantage over mice because you cannot raise the body temperature of a mouse by eight or nine degrees Celsius because it's homeothermic, whereas flies are poikilothermic. Their body temperature is the same at whatever their environmental temperature is. So if the lab is 23 degrees, the flies are 23 degrees. If the lab is 32 degrees, the flies are 32. So flies in the era of thermogenetics, which is what we were doing in from our first fly paper, which was 2004, up to our first uh, fly aggression neuron paper, which was 2014, that was all thermogenetics and their flies had a big advantage over mice. But when optogenetics broke, um, flies were off limits to this. So here you had what was arguably the most powerful technology for manipulating neuronal activity, optogenetics, and the most powerful system for genetically marking and manipulating specific populations of neurons in a brain, fruit flies, and you couldn't put those two together. But after red light activated opsins, we could do that. So that was good, but it still put us at a disadvantage um, between mice and flies for another reason. And that is uh, that the inability to record signals from active neurons in freely behaving flies. Uh, and, and so that's really the, I would say, the third major branch of what uh, any neuroscientist interested in how neural circuits control behavior would want to do. They would want to functionally perturb neurons to see how turning them on or turning them off affects behavior. They would want to, so that's the manipulation. They would want to map the connections of these neurons, the inputs and the outputs. And they would want to measure activity in those particular genetically 
marked neurons. So those are sort of what I call the four M's of circuit neuroscience, mark, map, manipulate, and measure uh, the neurons. And again, here is where this tiny size of the fly brain and a fly neuron. So fly brain is smaller than a grain of rice. I mean, the whole fly is like the size of a brain, a grain of rice. And fly neurons are only about uh, two microns in diameter, the cell bodies. And uh, it makes it very difficult to record neuronal activity. And even those rare people who could do that, and in fact, the first paper reporting electrophysiology on flies, fly neurons, uh, came out of Caltech, not from my lab. It was done by Rachel Wilson, who was a postdoc in Gilles Laurent's lab uh, when he was at Caltech. Even then, you could only record one neuron at a time uh, in the fly brain. Um, and what you really want to be able to do is to record from multiple neurons at the same time so you can compare the activity of different neurons in a particular brain region or in two different brain regions. And that's something that we, again, had started already to do in mice by 2011. We put a bundle of electrodes in the ventromedial hypothalamus, and we were the first people to record electrical signals from neurons firing during aggression in the mouse ventromedial hypothalamus. And the, the, uh, the second sort of critical breakthrough in technology for the mouse was uh, the development of miniature head-mounted microscopes for doing calcium imaging through uh, micro needle glass lenses that can be inserted into the brain um, in mice. And that technology, uh, uh, again, like optogenetics came out of Stanford, uh, but from uh, a physis optical physicist named Mark Schnitzer. And so these are uh, two gram microscopes that you can put on the mouse's head and the mouse will learn to adapt to their weight and if you genetically modify the neurons you're interested in to express a um, calcium sensitive jellyfish fluorescent protein, uh, which flashes more brightly every time the neuron fires because calcium comes into the cell and binds the jellyfish protein and makes it flash, um, then you can record activity deep in the brain of a freely behaving mouse. And moreover, you can record activity from genetically targeted cells because you can use genetic markers for cell populations uh, to determine what neurons you are going to record from. And so we published the first application of using that technology to record neuronal activity in the hypothalamus during mouse social behavior in 2017. Meanwhile, we still have no information in 2017, uh, even in the end of 2022, ironically, about whether the aggression neurons we discovered in flies by genetic manipulations of their function are actually active normally when those animals are performing the behaviors that you can, uh, the aggressive behaviors. Um, it is possible, and we have used this technology to do calcium imaging in flies that are head fixed under a two photon microscope. In fact, it's possible in principle to image activity across the entire fly brain. And we've published um, some papers on that, as have other people. Um, we published a paper on that in 2020. Uh, um, but right now, there's no way to do that type of two-photon microscopy to measure calcium activity in the brain of a freely moving fly. There have been a couple of techniques that people have tried uh, and have published on uh, to, to do an approximation to that 
uh, but uh, they haven't been widely adopted uh, and they're very complicated and difficult to set up. So this is a case where I would say the fly system in the early 2000s started off as being vastly more advantageous than mice for studying circuit neuroscience. And then starting in about 2005, mice started to improve until they started crossing and for certain kinds of experiments actually became better than flies. Uh, and that's been reflected in the fact that the number of people that have wanted to come to my lab and, and to other labs in general to study circuit neuroscience in fruit flies uh, has uh, fallen dramatically uh, in the period since uh, 2017, 2018, whereas it's continued to skyrocket um, in, uh, in mouse. And, you know, basically the way that many people look at mice versus flies is that flies are a system that you use to do experiments that you can't do in a mouse. As soon as you can do a certain kind of experiment in a mouse that you can also do in a fly, or especially if you can't do it in a fly, then the justification for using flies um, vastly diminishes because after all, mice are mammals, their brains basically have the same structure as ours. And what everybody wants to know about in the end is what our brains, how our brains work. And uh, uh, the fly's brain is very different in its organization from the mammalian brain. Now, other labs using head fixed flies and two photon imaging have in the meantime made some spectacular discoveries in fly systems neuroscience in very narrow restricted areas, particularly the question of how flies navigate direction. They basically have found the equivalent of neur a neuronal compass in the fly's brain, which is actually neurons that are in a ring and there's a bump of electrical activity that moves to different positions around the ring as the fly is facing different uh, um, uh, uh, positions along the uh, XY axis. And so that's been sort of the epitome uh, of, uh, of fly computational neuroscience. But that's not uh, the type of behavior that we are interested in explaining. And um, so it's become more difficult to justify uh, the use of flies uh, for studying aggression. Now, the in theory, the connectome of the fly should change that because it will be easily, I think, five years and probably closer to 10 before we have a complete connectome of the mouse brain. I mean, it's just orders of magnitude larger and more difficult. It's 10 to the eighth neurons compared to 10 to the fifth neurons in the fly brain. And it's a centimeter long versus uh, a millimeter long in, or uh, even less than a millimeter long in some cases in the fly brain. Um, and, but as I say, we're still in the, in the early days of fly connectomics where we have a female connectome and the male connectome is being assembled now and hopefully will become available in another six months. But that is really transformative. That has had the same effect on fly circuit neuroscience research that the human genome had on genetics research. That is, you no longer have to map connections between neurons that you discover because the connections have already been, are already there in the EM connectome. They're loaded onto a database in the computer and you can search that database starting from any particular neuron of interest and immediately identify through various algorithms that people have developed all of the inputs 
to that neuron all the outputs, not just the first order inputs but and outputs, but second order, third order, fourth order inputs. So that's the good news. The bad news is that it's made it painfully obvious how overwhelmingly complex the connectivity of the fly brain is. I mean, there may only be about 20,000 neurons or so on either side of the central fly brain, but on average, each neuron projects to at least five and sometimes 10 other neurons and may receive projections from dozens of input neurons. And so trying to figure out which of those connections is relevant to the particular behavior that you're interested in studying is still a very challenging and daunting task. So we, we have a project going on in the lab that is using the female connectome uh, to study an aspect uh, of aggressive behavior that you can study in females as well as males. But uh, other than getting a sort of a diagram with a number of hypotheses that are suggested by the diagram, uh, testing those hypotheses experimentally about what are the connections that control which types of behavior and what do they do uh, is really daunting still. And we still have the problem that we can't um, record activity from the neurons that we're interested in uh, in freely moving flies. And unfortunately, the uh, social behavior like aggression is not amenable to being performed by a fly when it's glued underneath an objective yeah. of a two photon microscope and it can walk on a little uh, a styrofoam ball mounted on an air cushion, but it certainly is not going to be able to fight with another fly. And so where the fly field has moved now is, um, it, like I say, it's, it's, it's been the most effective in studying those behaviors and aspects of neural coding, like uh, uh, direction uh, finding that can be done in a head fixed fly under a two photon microscope. Uh, and so I think that's where uh, the mouse really has uh, an advantage now over the fly. And I have to say, I'm, I'm torn. Um, there, there are days when I felt like maybe it's time to just close down the fly operation completely um, because I don't have that many students or postdocs working on it anymore. Uh, I only have about three people as opposed to 10 people working on mice. Um, and the number of problems that I can study in flies, but not in mice, is dwindling as the technology yeah. um, improves to a greater and greater extent. And that was also, I have to say, impacted by the uh, uh, development in 2014 of the NIH Brain Initiative. Mm -hmm. This was a program that uh, President Obama started brain research for advancing innovative neurotechnologies uh, and it's continued to run and will run until 2025 and much of the funding in the first five years of brain was focused and is still focused on technology development and specifically technology development in mammals in mice uh, maybe in non-human primates much less work supported on fruit flies and so I think that where there's more technology that's being developed, you're going to have more uh, uh, opportunities to do experiments that you couldn't do before. And I think that's uh, that's affected the uh, shift as well. And as I say, young people are voting with their feet. Mm -hmm. They're voting with their feet. Um, and there, there are uh, a handful of labs that are doing first-rate work on sort of computational aspects of fly direction sensing and movement. Michael Dickinson's here on campus is one of those, but you can sort of count those labs on the fingers of two hands. And um, uh, mine is not one of them simply because 
um, uh, aggression is not amenable uh, to whole brain imaging um, in in Drosophila. And of course, I, when I started, like I say, when I started working on Drosophila, it had multiple advantages over mice. But technology changes, and so uh, the benefit of systems change. I think Drosophila will still be a good system for linking genes to behavior, which is what Seymour Benzer wanted to do, through their action on specific cell circuits, neural circuits. But the pendulum hasn't is still squarely centered right now on circuit level analysis of behavioral control and hasn't swung back to trying to study the effects of genes on behavioral control in, in fruit flies. David, if I can make a, a clarifying question, I think it's a really yeah. important point. So you've laid out all of the various distinctions between flies and mice, whether it you know refers to the presence of viruses or the technology available to access a tiny fly brain. At the end of the day, with all things being equal, let's say there are no uh, technological limitations. Are flies and mice equally valuable for studying aggression? And I mean that both in the fundamental science sense, but then also in the applied sense, because as you alluded, we're sort of more interested in mice because they're mammals and their brains are more like us. But that seems more like a translational kind of line of reasoning. So I wonder if you can address all of that. Yeah. So uh, to answer the first part of the question, if there were no differences in uh, technology, if we could record activity from neurons in any neuron we wanted to in freely moving flies, um, I think I would... Uh, uh, choose flies over mice if for no other reason than that they are so much cheaper to work with that I wouldn't have to spend uh, all my time writing grants to support the research. Uh, it's it's huge. It's orders of magnitude difference in the amount of money to run a fly lab versus a mouse lab. Um, in terms, and, and I think many of the general principles that have already emerged from studying neural circuits in flies will apply to mice and to humans, although their implementation may be different. So mice have a quote unquote neural compass for sensing head direction, encoding head direction, but it doesn't look like an anatomical ring or a disc in the mouse brain as it does in the fly brain. It's topologically equivalent to a ring or a disc, but it's not topographically uh, in instantiated as a disc. Now, in terms of translation, um, there's obviously a major difference when it comes to learning um, therapies that are aimed at specific cell populations and brain regions. Because, for example, in psychiatric disorders, there's a lot of evidence implicating the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala and other regions in mental illness. And uh, people are, many, many labs are working hard to try to identify the different cell populations in those regions and to understand what aspects of, for example, fear, anxiety, aggression uh, they encode with the hope that some of that will be translatable to humans. Although even going from mice to humans is a is a big leap, um, but nevertheless, humans have a prefrontal cortex and an amygdala. Flies don't, right? They just they don't have those same brain structures. What they do have are genes that act in some of their circuits that control their behaviors. And there, I think uh, our work and that of others have provided some very strong examples of translation from flies to mice. So, for example, uh, our, our one of our first fly uh, aggression papers um, in molecular uh, and circuit papers in 2014 identified a neuropeptide called tachykinin, Drosophila tachykinin, that is specifically expressed in neurons that control aggression in males. And we showed that the gene 
is necessary for aggression. Uh, and the gene encoding the receptor uh, uh, that uh, binds to this neuropeptide, which is a chemical message released from one neuron to another, is important in flies. And we also showed that uh, social isolation, which makes flies more aggressive, does so in part by elevating the amount of expression of this peptide in the brain. Four years later in 2018, we showed that the same thing was true in mice, that the mouse homologue of this neuropeptide gene was also strongly increased in its expression by social isolation. And we were able to show that that increase was necessary and sufficient to explain the increase in aggression caused by socially isolating mice. And humans have this uh, uh, protein as well. And in fact, there are drugs that block the action of this protein. And I've been trying since 2018 to uh, convince investors uh, to invest in a biotech startup aimed at translating that finding into humans. And for various reasons I can get into separately, um, no one's been interested. But that is an example of how a gene that was ignored in the context of aggression and social isolation in mice suddenly became highly relevant as a consequence of the discoveries that we made in fruit flies. And there, because you can line up the sequence of a gene in the fly and you can immediately find the homologous gene in a mouse just by doing a search on the computer and then figure out where that gene is expressed in the mouse brain by doing another search on the computer. There's a much more uh, direct line of translation uh, into something that is potentially therapeutically relevant to humans. David, before we allow that tangent to fall yeah. off, why has no one been interested in that line of research? Uh, it's because of uh, what I said before about mice being closer to humans, but not close enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, drugs that block the action of this peptide um, were developed uh, and tested in humans for their ability to treat schizophrenia and major depressive disorder based on some experiments in rodents that were in retrospect, very shaky and not very uh, uh, um, rigorously done, and they failed in their efficacy in the clinic. The good news is the drugs were not dangerous, they were well tolerated, but they didn't show any efficacy. When, when a pharma company fails in a drug trial after having cost them about $100 million, 50 to $100 million down the drain in a clinical trial, and with a particular molecule, uh, once it's failed with that, it's um, once burned, twice shy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, pharma companies and venture capitalists have been understandably not eager to try to invest money in this, um, in this class of drugs, again, based on findings in mice, because why is there any reason to think they would translate into humans. And I can understand that. Uh, and we're trying to think of ways of de-risking that process of translating from mice into humans. Uh, but that's going to take some time and it's going to take some investment. So we're, we're not there yet. The idea that mice are not close enough to humans, there's a logic there that would suggest that there's a compelling factor to move on to monkey research. Although I wonder if that's, you know, more of a political than even a technological or a budgetary non-starter. No, it's not a non-starter. And in fact, uh, there is a group at MIT that has made a major investment in studying marmosets, which are a small non-human primate, much smaller than the rhesus monkeys that have been the workhorse of most of non-human primate neuroscience, mainly visual neuroscience up to now. Um, marmosets uh, have a shorter gestation time. 
they're usually born as uh, fraternal twins, um, and and uh, they're smaller, so it costs less to house them. And it is believed, quote unquote, that because they're non-human primates, their brains, particularly in areas relevant to psychiatric disorders like the medial prefrontal cortex, will be more relevant or more predictive of things in humans than uh, is the case in mice. Um, that remains to be seen. Um, furthermore, working with any non-human primate, whether it's a rhesus macaque or a marmoset, is hugely expensive. And so the numbers of animals that you can work on is highly constrained. Um, for example, when we publish a paper uh, on recording activity in a mouse, uh, in mice during a, a behavior like aggression, for example, it's based on minimum of six and often uh, or over a dozen individual mice where we perform the same experiment and, and uh, to make sure the results are consistent across animals, whereas in the monkey field, it's acceptable to have one mouse, or one monkey, results from one monkey, sometimes two at most, be the basis, uh, sufficient, a sufficient N to, to uh, be a statistically meaningful sample. And people are more concerned with how many neurons they're recording from in that monkey than how many monkeys they are recording from. But I think the real reason is it's just would be prohibited, prohibitively expensive to to have uh, even six monkeys uh, in in each paper that you were uh, doing. Furthermore, because monkeys are so valuable and because they're so expensive, uh, you it's it's a real issue uh, as to whether you're going to sacrifice the monkey at the end of an experiment to look inside your in their brain and see if you actually hit the spot you were aiming for with your injections of viruses or whatever, or fiber optic cables or not. And we do that routinely in all of our mouse experiments. And so we map precisely in uh, each mouse where uh, the injection site was, where the fiber optic cable went. And in many cases, that's important because we'll do the experiment, say, on six mice, and it'll work great in five mice, but in the sixth mouse, for some reason, the experiment doesn't work. But then when you slice the brains up, you find that in that sixth mouse, the uh, student who did the injection missed the target site by a couple of hundred microns. And so you can eliminate that mouse from the analysis because you didn't perform the experiment you thought you were doing. But you have to kill the mouse to do that. And people are not going to do say, a single optogenetic experiment in a monkey, particularly one that they've spent months and months and months training to do a particular task, and then kill it and slice its brain up to see if they injected the virus where they thought they were injecting the virus. To return to this binary of translational versus fundamental yeah. research, in the way that you're explaining, a mouse is better than a fly and a monkey is better than a mouse. But does that apply in both realms? In other words, are monkeys fundamentally the best, all things being equal, technology, budget? Let's say those are not considerations, both from a fundamental research perspective about understanding aggression and for ultimately understanding the human brain and developing technologies and therapies that could be helpful for humans. Does it work in both cases? Or I wonder if you could you could elucidate a little there. Um, <clears throat> I would say that it depends on the question you're asking and uh, the tools that are available. Um, and, uh, and also on just the, the, the size issue. So just as a fly brain is too small to inject a virus into or stick an electrode into, the monkey brain is so huge mm -hmm. in comparison to a mouse that it's often difficult to inject just enough virus to cover the one region of the brain that you're interested in. Uh -huh. So uh, size for some studies 
can be an advantage because it allows you to separate things anatomically, but particularly for functional perturbation experiments, it can become, uh, and, and those using viruses or optogenetics, it can be a disadvantage. So I think that um, even if technology was equal, cost was equal, you're not going to change the size difference between a monkey brain, even a marmoset brain, and a mouse brain, and that is one of the uh, one of the impediments. As is the generation time, right? The generation time of a mouse is uh, about three months. Uh, for a marmoset, I think it's um, it's at least a year be between the time they go through the gestation and grow up, reach sexual maturity, and are able to produce uh, another generation. So there are, the experiments are a lot slower um, in mice than in monkeys. Now, if I were just doing translational research and cost was no object and there was no technology difference, maybe uh, I would, um, uh, I, I would uh, favor marmosets slightly, but I think there just isn't enough uh, data, particularly on their behavior yet, uh, to say whether the, all of the other sacrifices that you would have to make. Um, and of course, money really is a constraining factor, sure. as is access to animals. Right. I mean, we have large repositories of mice in the country, like the Jackson Labs, um, and Charles River, which make mice essentially available in an unlimited numbers, whereas uh, the number of monkeys is highly limited just because uh, they're expensive to breed and maintain, and there aren't facilities that maintain large numbers of them for distribution. Even the group at MIT, which has sort of cornered the market on marmosets, has a limited number of animals that they can maintain at any one time. Uh, I think it's on the order of 100 or so, or 50, uh, 50 to 100 animals, certainly not enough to supply the world marmoset community if everybody decided to drop mice and rats and work on marmosets. Beyond the cost, is there a political factor there, a squeamishness that makes marmoset research simply less attractive? That depends on the individual. Uh, for me personally, I think I would feel uncomfortable about, uh, since we study emotions that are unpleasant and behaviors that can be dangerous, like aggression or fear or panic, I would feel, uh, 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 worth it. feel comfortable um, uh, uh, using performing those sorts of experiments on monkeys, unless I could be convinced that the thing I wanted to understand absolutely could not be understood in a mouse. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, pure anthropocentrism, and there's no sort of rational justification that mice may feel just as bad as the monkeys do when I give them a foot shock. Uh, they may be as freaked out as monkeys would be when they're fighting. I have no way of telling, but um, monkeys look more like us, and I identify more with them. I wouldn't do those kinds of experiments to a cat because I have a pet cat. Yeah. Um, so, so I uh, from 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 the my non-scientific part of my brain set some limits uh, on what I would be willing to do. Something that was seemingly counterintuitive. So you emphasize the importance of technological advance to be able yeah. to shift from flies to mice. But then you also explain how difficult it is, for example, to access a fly brain with the availability of the fiber optic cables, which are almost as big as the, the brain itself. Wouldn't it follow then simply as a larger organism that it would go the other way, that you would need the technology to advance in order to get from mice to flies? Yeah. Uh, it would. Uh, it's not going to be by fiber optic uh, cable. Um, it's It's got to be by imaging. And there still is a problem in imaging activity of multiple neurons 
in a freely moving animal. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the two systems where that has been done the most successfully to date are in the nematode worm C. elegans, which is transparent. Uh, uh, it's only about a millimeter long. That's what uh, Paul Sternberg works on. And it's only got 302 neurons. And then the zebrafish larvae, um, which are considerably longer. I think they're maybe the length of half a thumbnail, so maybe half a centimeter or something like that. And they have 100,000 neurons. And people have succeeded in imaging activity in all 100,000 neurons simultaneously, but not in a freely swimming zebrafish. They usually have the head uh, and brain, central brain, immobilized in a block of agar. And then the body and the tail are free to move around so that they can see if the fish is trying to swim and in what direction it is trying to swim. Uh, but trying to keep track of uh, hundreds of thousands of neurons that are being optically identified in a tiny animal as it's flitting around in a tank of water and going at different depths is really challenging. And flies, unfortunately, are not transparent. So there may be a few, as I said, there are some technologies where people have made glass windows in the cuticle of a fly and they have expressed the fluorescent calcium indicator GCAMP so specifically that you don't really need a microscope to tell which neurons are active. You can just use a photomultiplier tube to count photons coming through the hole in the fly's brain. And you know that those photons, you know which neurons they're coming from because it's only two or three neurons in the whole brain that are expressing uh, the calcium genetically encoded calcium sensor. Uh, but the number of experiments like that that you can do are few and far between, and flies don't like to do things like fight after you've made a hole in their head and glued a plain, uh, plate of glass uh, on top of them. So I think uh, that is, it's been interesting to watch these trajectories yeah. um, uh, develop. I think that um, fly neuroscience research Will, the circuit part will continue to thrive for behaviors that can be studied in head fixed animals. For behaviors in freely moving animals, it will tend to go deep. That is from the circuit level down to the cell and to the molecule level. Whereas in mice and in monkeys, it will start to go broad, which is to try to measure activity in as many different regions of the brain as you can simultaneously. Uh, for example, people like Richard Anderson and Doris Chow, when she was here, already used fMRI on rhesus monkeys to identify the regions of the cortex that respond to faces. And this is in a, an awake behaving monkey. You can't really do fMRI on a, an awake behaving mouse because it's too small, it will squirm around and move too much, and it'll also be freaked out by all of the uh, uh, noise in the magnet. Uh, so there isn't yet an fMRI equivalent in, in the mouse, but there are other approaches people use. In the way students, as you said, are voting with their feet, where the number of fly researchers is dwindling and mice researchers is, is growing, are there technological advances? Is there a limit? Is there a Moore's law of nanotechnology that makes further advances in fly research basically impossible because there's no technology on the horizon? No, I would never say that. I would never say that. If, if people are able to generate uh, nanoscale silicon probes such that you could implant a silicon probe array in the brain of a fly and record from hundreds of neurons in a freely moving fly, that would be a game changer. And I'm sure that there are people that are doing that. It's just that the community is not that large. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's maybe 2,000 or 3,000 uh, uh, people studying all aspects of fly neuroscience, including developmental neuroscience, molecular neuroscience, not just behavior and circuits. Um, there's 35,000 people that are studying 
uh, uh, rice, mice, rats, monkeys of various kinds. And so there's just a much greater demand for uh, new technology advancement. To zoom out on your overall research agenda, a quip you made in our last discussion where you said, you know, the, the story of your research career, at least up until 2010, was make a significant discovery and then promptly walk away from the field. Why then, it begs the question, what was it about aggression circa 2010 that compelled you to stay on it, even if you were interested more broadly in emotions, why stick with aggression and not go on to fear, for example? What was so compelling yeah. about aggression? Yeah, so uh, the the main reason was that I wanted to align the work that was going on in flies and mice mm -hmm. in my lab. And there is no question in anyone's mind that flies fight with each other when you watch them in a movie. They even look like little boxers. They stand up in their hind legs, tussle with each other. They lunge at each other. Sometimes they throw each other in the air. No one would disagree with you if you said these flies are fighting. And same thing is true of fighting mice or fighting rats. Um, fear, ironically, turns out to be more difficult. And the reason gets down to, in part, to language and definition. Notice when I talk about aggression, I'm using a word that describes a behavior. When I talk about fear, I'm using a word that describes an emotion. Uh -huh. And that's really not the right way to talk about it. Either if you're gonna if you're gonna compare uh, those two sort of domains, you should either talk about fear versus anger or freezing and running versus fighting, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, and there, the problem uh, with um, uh, studying uh, defensive behavior, particularly predator defensive behavior in fruit flies is, first of all, they fly away. <laughs> so if you were to, you know, approach them with a spider and try to study their responses, they're going to fly away. Now, yes, you could put them under a two photon microscope and head fix them and record activity in their brains. Uh, but uh, and people do that for mice. But the vast majority of work on defensive behavior in mice and rats is performed on freely moving uh, uh, animals uh, because they behave more naturalistically when they're not locked into a head stage under a microscope. The other thing, uh, and this is sort of where the rubber hits the road in uh, the things that I've written about in my book uh, and papers, is that in the case of defensive behavior in flies, it's more difficult to make a distinction between whether you're studying a reflex or a state driven behavior than in the case of aggression. So most people, if you ask them, uh, when the fly jumps off the kitchen counter while you're trying to swat at it with a fly swatter, is it afraid? They would say, well, it's just a jump reflex. And indeed we know that there are jump reflexes in the fly brain that control these rapid reflexive escape responses. Now, we think, and we have some evidence for, that there are also aspects of defensive behavior in flies that are driven by internal states in that at least the behaviors show properties like scalability, persistence, valence, generalization, other features that are characteristic of uh, emotion state driven behaviors in mice. And we've measured them and published that in a paper in 2015, but it's very difficult to do. Uh, um, so you have this sort of, um, I don't want to call it the, the uh, face validity of fear in uh, flies is harder 
to is less compelling than the face validity that is what it what it looks like on its face and by its nature than is the face validity of aggression in flies and there's the additional question of whether defensive behaviors that you can study uh, are uh, 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 reflexes or or state driven behaviors in fact I think before we published our 2015 paper, it wasn't even clear whether flies show freezing behavior in response to a threat, whereas freezing has been the main behavior that's been used for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years to study fear and defensive behaviors in rats and mice. So we were able to document some rare short-lived cases of freezing in flies in response to a moving overhead shadow, uh, but nowhere near as robust as what you see in, uh, in mice. And that again gets back to the issue of face validity. Like I said, mice fight and it looks superficially like flies are doing the same thing, although they don't bite each other because they don't have teeth, but they lunge at each other and tussle with each other. Um, and so you can make a one-to-one -one face validity link between aggression and flies and mice. Uh, much harder to do that for freezing behavior. You can do it for escape behavior, uh, but there's paradoxically less work done on escape behavior in rodents than on freezing behavior because the animal runs away. In the way that you're making a distinction between reflexes and emotions, are they both fundamentally related to survival? And in other words, where I'm going with this is, you know, for example, in higher order animals, where it seems as if elephants can engage in mourning practices or dolphins can exhibit empathy, which seemingly have no basis in survival, at least, you know, in terms of fight or flight. Can you connect those higher order emotions with the kinds of things you're studying? Or is that essentially universes away? Uh, so basically, you're, you're raising two issues that are somewhat conflated here. One is the distinction between the evolution of emotion per se as a type of behavioral control mechanism distinct from reflex, stimulus response reflexes, versus the evolution of different kinds of of emotion, mm -hmm. okay? So I think most people in the emotion field would agree that fear is a more evolutionarily ancient and primal emotion than, for example, shame or guilt, which are really characteristic of high, more highly developed social uh, vertebrates and in particular uh, mammals. And so, yes, there's a universe of difference if you want to study emotions of different types, types that are found in uh, in uh, higher mammals, um, but that's different from the case in uh, um, in in studying survival uh, behaviors. The second conflated issue is whether there, to, to sort of paraphrase what you said, if I understood correctly, um, does every emotional display have a survival value and Darwin certainly argued that it did and his entire 1872 monograph is based on explaining why certain emotions are expressed behaviorally in the way that they are and what is the survival or selective advantage of having that type, that particular expression. I mean, it's obvious in the case of defensive behavior, uh, freezing to avoid detection by a predator, flight to avoid entrapment and capture by a predator. It's obvious in the case of threat behaviors and aggression behaviors. Um, if you talk about um, grieving uh, and empathy and, and parenthetically, um, I, I would dispute whether it has been rigorously and objectively shown that elephants are capable of grieving and, uh, 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 uh dolphins of empathy. These are based on, uh, 
observations of animals in the wild, not experimental manipulations of any kind, and they're laden with anthropomorphism mm -hmm. and anthropocentrism. Um, and so, and that's something that in my research, I've tried to avoid by developing these objective criteria for what I call emotion primitives, features of emotional behaviors that distinguish them from reflex behaviors like scalability, persistence, uh, valence, generalizability, uh, et cetera. Um, and so I don't have to first guess at what kind of emotion the animal is showing and whether it corresponds to an emotion that I have as a human or understand as, as a human. So I would, I believe that any emotional display in any animal ultimately has survival value, if not for the individual, maybe for the group of animals. But, uh, you know, asking me to explain that for dolphin empathy and elephant grief would be just asking me to make up just so stories. There's, there's, I don't know it. I, I can just, you know, invent answers if I thought about it for a while. But would it follow then that with your suspicion that elephants truly exhibit mourning or dolphins exhibit empathy, that humans are capable of these things and that they are essential for our survival? I mean, what's the continuum here? What does that look like for you? Um, so I don't need uh -huh. elephants and dolphins to tell me that humans have empathy and grief. Uh, I know that from my own subjective experience and from uh, uh, asking other humans uh, about their own subjective experiences. Um, and so you're, you're asking the question of uh, how continuous is this and is there a discontinuity in, in type of emotional expression? And if so, where do you draw the line? And that is a very difficult question to answer. It's not as easy as something like language mm -hmm. or music or mathematical ability, which we can clearly say no other animal that we know of on the planet has these abilities. I mean, there's some arguments about whether certain animals can count and whether they can learn a quote unquote language if they're trained to do it in the laboratory. Um, but the bottom line is there are certain brain regions that have been identified through fMRI scanning in humans that are critical for music and critical for language uh, by people like Nancy Canwisher at MIT. And you don't find those regions in non-human primates, at least not in rhesus macaques. Now, they may exist in a chimpanzee or a gorilla, but you're not allowed to put a chimpanzee or a gorilla in a brain scanner uh, for ethical reasons. So we'll never know the answer uh, to that um, question. But um, uh, it is, it is a, it's a hard question in the case of emotion and particularly for things, social emotions like shame, guilt, embarrassment, uh, and that kind of thing. It's, it's very hard to think of ways of identifying behaviors that display those emotions in a non-human primate even without result, resorting to grossly anthropomorphizing the animals. And uh, there's, there's uh, an interesting article uh, in National Geographic about animal emotions in the last issue. I'm briefly mentioned in it as the sort of example of the bad guy who is too hard-nosed about anthropomorphizing. And <laughs> why don't we just forget about that and enjoy all the things we can uh, deduce about animals without worrying about anthropomorphizing. And there's the, but it does admit that anthropomorphizing can be ambiguous and you can be fooled. And there's a great photograph showing a what looks like a jungle explorer up to his waist in uh, 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 a, a uh, water hole and close to the bank, but not close enough to easily climb out. And there's an orangutan 
on the bank, hanging to a tree with his hand outstretched to the to, to the person. Okay, your natural uh, interpretation, your anthropomorphic interpretation from looking at that image is that he's offering help to the human who's stuck in the mud hole. But it could just be that he's asking for food from the human because he's been around enough humans to know that they carry treats and rewards with them. And what he's really thinking is, you know, yeah, you're going to be dead in a few hours or so because you're not going to get out of that hole. So while you're at it, why don't you give me all of your bubble gum and candy and I'll <laughs> see you in another life. <laughs> you have to be so careful about what we attribute to animals based simply on observing their behavior and pushing ourselves onto uh, their existence and saying, well, here's what we would be doing if we looked like that and sounded like that and acted like that. Therefore, an animal that looks, sounds, and acts that way must be doing the same thing as we would, and therefore we can infer their internal state. Even with a great ape, in a natural situation, it's ambiguous. Perhaps a less fraught question. You explained wonderfully, you know, the complexity of these maps and the years that it will take to get there. And I think immediately of all of the phenomenal advances in computational power, even over the last 20 years, is that are the things you're talking about so complex that even supercomputers are not up to the task? Mm. Very good question. So, um, Conic, the field of connectomics is, uh, involves taking a brain, slicing it up in one way or another into very, very thin sections, imaging each section in an electron microscope at tens of nanometer resolution, and then stitching those sections back together again to reconstruct all of the nerve fibers and axons and cell bodies uh, because you can't visualize those in just a slice of brain. You have to fix the brain and stain it with a contrast agent that allows you to delineate the perimeter of individual cells and their axons and fibers and uh, collect that data. So there have been two technological roadblocks in connectomics. The first has been simply the process of sectioning brains at scale and scanning and collecting the EM data in a way that doesn't damage the specimens or lose sections. Uh, you collect thousands of sections from a brain, you drop a couple of those on the bench top, and you're done. You, you've got to throw that brain out because you have a gap in your reconstruction. But those problems, thankfully, have largely been solved by very clever experimental physicists and engineers. Uh, the second problem has been uh, the segmentation and reconstruction problem. And by segmentation, what I mean is this, that if you imagine um, a group of neurons whose cell bodies are next to each other and that they are sending out axons. And now imagine slicing that block of tissue into sections that are perpendicular to the long axis of the nerve fiber. In cross section, the nerve fiber is going to look like a donut. Now, if all neurons had rigid axons that just pointed straight ahead with no deviation, the problem of assigning the donut in each section to the originating cell body of the neuron whose axon that donut has sliced through would be pretty easy. But axons are not straight, rigid tubes. They weave back and forth through the brain. They branch highly. And so the process of segmenting, literally drawing outlines around individual cells and separating the perimeter of one cell from the perimeters of all of the other cells that are packed up against it in the tissue, and then doing that for every section, and then stitching those sections together has really been 
the rate limiting step for a long time. And many people in the uh, uh, in the early stages of connectomics, I would say uh, even up to 2015, 2016, were doing this by crowdsourcing or by having armies of graduate students sit at computer screens and monitors drawing things by hand. And obviously you could only reconstruct very tiny volumes of tissue uh, in that way. And so the transformation has been computing. It's been that people have figured out how to use machine learning and machine vision to train. A lot of this work has gone on at Google to basically train a machine learning algorithm to do the segmentation and uh, the uh, reconstruction stitching together process. It's not perfect. It still has to be proofread, spot proofread in different places by uh, humans, but it's turned the process uh, of reconstruction of EM section brains from something that was basically impossible to do on all but the teeniest little bit of tissue into something that now can potentially be scaled up certainly to an entire fruit fly brain with its 100,000 neurons in it. Um, and that's been done and is being done. It'll be done in the larval zebrafish. And as I said, probably in the next maybe five years, it'll get done in mice, at least in part of the mouse brain, probably the cortex, which is, in my opinion, the least interesting part of the mouse brain, but it's the one that people are able to raise the most money for. So it will, because we do all of our thinking and talking and math and everything with our cortex, even though the mouse doesn't. Um, but that's where it will probably get done uh, first. So yes, uh, computational tools uh, have been critical in that respect. Computational tools have been critical in turning the measurement of behavior from an incredibly subjective, qualitative, and highly investigator idiosyncratic process into a rigorous, quantitative, consistent uh, methodology has also been based on machine vision and machine learning. And that's something that Pietro Perona uh, who's a professor of electrical engineering here and who's been my uh, on and off collaborator on this since 2008, uh, have spent a lot of time doing in uh, flies and in uh, uh, in mice. And we wrote a, uh, what I think was a pretty influential review on this called Computational Ethology in Neuron in 2014. Michael Dickinson has done a lot of this as well, also in collaboration with Pietro. And that's now exploded into a huge field where people are using supervised classifiers and unsupervised classifiers to dissect the behavior of animals at various levels of complexity uh, from the kinematic level to a uh, whole animal level. So that's another area where uh, computation has been critical. And then a third area is in the uh, analysis of, of very large high dimensional sets of neural activity data. So when you are recording from hundreds or now even thousands of neurons in a single imaging plane at 30 frames per second over a period of 20 minutes as we do or 30 minutes routinely, um, you generate vast amounts of data, upwards of many terabytes of data from a single experiment. And it's been critical, uh, again, machine learning, machine vision, as well as other uh, statistical tools and mathematical approaches have been critical for people to try to make sense of that, because we can't think in four or five dimensions, let alone in a hundred or a thousand dimensions. So there are various dimensionality reduction techniques that have been developed for trying to extract signals from neural activity data. And same kinds of approaches have been used at a low, finer scale uh, level of uh, investigation, the level of gene expression in individual cells, where uh, you're measuring the activity of 10,000 genes in each of 
30,000 cells simultaneously and trying to use that information to classify the cells into similar groups, which you call cell types. And again, there was both a technological uh, advance that spurred that and now advances in computational methods uh, for analyzing those data. So uh, at many scales of biological organization from molecular and cellular biology to neural circuit activity, to behavior, to reconstruction uh, of uh, neural circuit activity, uh, neuroscience has depended critically on uh, uh, massive parallel and high speed computation. And I think we still probably don't have as much computational power as people would like to have, particularly for the connectomics problems. But you're hopeful that co computation is up to the task in the coming years? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so, particularly if Moore's law uh, continues to accelerate. Um, we're uh, involved in our um, first connectomics project in collaboration with a lab in uh, Germany in a Max Planck Institute. Uh, there, believe it or not, the critical, most difficult problem to solve is how to send the specimens, the brains, back and forth from from the US to Germany and to get them through customs without having them being held up so long that they deteriorate and are no longer good enough to be used for EM connectomics. So I think once we solve the customs tr and transport problem, uh, the connectomics, uh, our collaborator thinks that we're just talking about the ventromedial hypothalamic nucleus that we've been studying uh, for the last uh, 10 or uh, 11 years. He thinks that we should get uh, segmented and imaged in about four to six months. David, in our very first conversation, we talked in general terms about the Chen Institute, but now that we're in the narrative of the 2010s, do you have a clear memory when you first heard about Tian Chao and Chrissy and their ideas of partnering with Caltech? I think I actually first heard about them from friends at UCLA, where they had been uh, visiting and nosing around uh, and um, <clears throat> asking about supporting neuroscience at UCLA. Uh, at that time, I had no idea who they were. And the next time I heard about them was after uh, they and Richard Anderson had agreed uh, to engage in funding his research. And that then um, became expanded <coughs> by uh, the, our then division chair, Steve Mayo, to um, uh, pitch an idea that developed into a much broader support for neuroscience research at Caltech than just uh, Richard Anderson's research. Although funding for Richard Anderson's research is still a major part of the uh, of the Chen gift. It's about thirty percent, a little less than thirty percent of the endowment that um, is left uh, for Caltech, uh, uh, aside from the money that went into the Chen building. So uh, there's a, a strong support for Richard Anderson. But that's when I first heard about them. Um, and I only met them when I had to uh, uh, fly to Singapore with um, President Rosenbaum and uh, 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 Ed Stolper, who was provost at the time, and Steve Mayo for the actual signing of the agreement, because at that time the Chens were living in Singapore, and they didn't know me from a hole in the wall, and I didn't know who they were either. Uh, but fortunately, that's changed. And were you presented as you were going to be leading the Institute or that was part of the discussions that the Chens were in? No, I was presented by that time. Uh, they, Steve had asked me if I would be the director of the Institute and uh, with certain provisions um, and negotiations, I said that I would do it. And so by the time we got the reason I was brought to Singapore was as the, as because I was at that point had agreed to be the director 
or at least the inaugural director uh, of the Chen Institute. Now, as you well know, the Chens are very interested in translational medicine and applications and things like that. Given that you're so fundamental in your interests, and even if you weren't, the timelines that you're talking about, these are still decades in the making. Was there any challenge in squaring that circle and getting them to understand the connections between the fundamental research and whatever managing of expectations in terms of timelines, or they got it from the beginning? Um, I think that their main expectation of a trans relatively short term translational payoff is from Richard Anderson's work in the area of brain machine interfaces. And that's really what Tian Chao is interested in. Um, I've talked to him about this. He's not interested in drugs or drug development. Um, he says that they are too risky. It takes too long to get their approval uh, by the FDA, which is true. The path for approval of medical devices, implantable devices like a pacemaker or an insulin pump, much, much shorter through the FDA than um, the path for uh, 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 drugs. Um, that said, um, I think the Chens have uh, uh, realized and accepted the fact that Caltech neuroscience is not going to be a cash cow of intellectual property, although there is a uh, uh, there is an intellectual property agreement um, related to uh, the Chen Institute and uh, the disposition of IP that comes out of it. And it's so complicated that you would have to ask somebody in the Office of Technology Transfer uh, to explain it to you. Um, they, they originally wanted um, uh, basically all IP that was developed in, uh, with Chen funding uh, in exchange for the funding, basically a sponsored research agreement. Um, and uh, Steve Mayo and the provost said no. Um, so part of me thinks that perhaps this may sound a little cynical, but perhaps they've sort of written off Caltech as a mistake in, in the sense that um, it, it doesn't really fit what I think their original model was of, of providing um, uh, new technology and IP to fuel Chen Tian Chao's entrepreneurial uh, uh, instincts and, uh, and interests in, in the area of remediating neurological and psychiatric disease. They are continuing to do that in a big way, especially in China. Um, so I, I think we here at Caltech are extremely lucky that um, Steve and uh, the, I guess also the director uh, of, um, of uh, what's now called uh, AAR, um, I forget his name, he's now at Harvard, uh, succeeded in getting the Chens to commit to a gift of the size that they uh, they ultimately made, which was $115 million, is one of the largest gifts, I think, that Caltech has received from someone who was neither an alumnus nor a trustee. Yeah. Most of our big givers are very close within the Caltech family. And I know that the Chen's uh, original intent was to make gifts of that size approximately every year or every other year to other academic institutions. And since 2016, when the Caltech Chen Institute was inaugurated, they have made exactly zero such uh, gifts. I think in large part uh, due to political issues, Tian Chao was strongly uh, criticized publicly on social media in China for having uh, uh, devoted such a large amount of money to supporting science in the United States rather than in China, which is where he made his money. 
And he was also concerned about the growing scrutiny uh, by the U.S. government of U.S. scientists with ties to China and people from China who are funding U.S. science. And so they just basically decided to step back uh, from uh, 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 philanthropy for um, neuroscience at, at the level that they funded it at Caltech. So we really here at Caltech just squeaked under the wire. And I had nothing to do with that part of it at all. That is all um, at, uh, uh, I think can be credited to Brian, I guess Brian Lee was the, uh, the director of development uh, at the time and Steve Mayo. And I guess to some extent um, also uh, Tom Rosenbaum and uh, Ed Stolper. David, there are two things going on here with regard to the Chens and their expectations about translational breakthroughs. One is just cultural, perhaps that Caltech is just too fundamental a kind of institution to operate on anything close to what the Chens might have hoped for. The other is, of course, is that the timeline is just reflective of the complexity of the science. And it doesn't matter if it's Stanford or the University of Shanghai. This is just really difficult stuff to bring to market. I wonder if you could comment in both regards. Yeah, I think you're right about both points. I mean, Caltech doesn't have a medical school, okay? It's very difficult to have a vibrant program of translational research without a medical school. Um, MIT doesn't have one, but they are very close by physically to Harvard and there are a lot of joint programs. Now we do have the Merkin Institute for Translational Research at, at Caltech, um, but that's a relatively uh, a small scale uh, um, uh, operation um, and, and, and certainly doesn't um, uh, uh, compensate for the lack of the medical school. But I think most people associated with Caltech, particularly those uh, in the administration and those like me who are focused on fundamental research are glad we don't have a medical school yeah. because of all of the additional headaches and, and costs and uh, uh, um, uh, regulatory compliance issues that, that come with it. But the flip side is, is that um, we can't raise as much money, uh, particularly in the biosciences, because most people who give money in the biosciences are giving it because they have a sick relative and they want the disease cured. Um, as far as it being a long road and that's gonna take as long at, in Shanghai as it would in uh, Stanford or Pasadena, um, I think that's probably true. Although I think in the area of brain machine interfaces and neuroprosthetics, it will probably move faster, particularly with the involvement of machine learning, because if machine learning has taught us nothing else, it's taught us that you don't have to understand a complex system in order to be able to make accurate predictions about how it is going to behave under certain circumstances or in response to certain stimuli. And that is a really tough thing to swallow, especially for those of us in the biosciences who were raised with the idea that if you want to cure diseases, you have to understand them and understand the normal biology, right? We couldn't cure diabetes until we understood that the pancreas made something called insulin and we understood what insulin was and what it did and that diabetes was a deficiency of insulin. Um, and we still haven't really cured the cause of diabetes because it's complicated. It's autoimmune or it has to do with what you eat, your metabolism, but we can at least treat it. But machine learning now, as I say, you can make predictions uh, that without understanding how something works, if you have enough measurements of various things that the computer can use to construct a feature space in which it can classify whatever you want it to classify. And so, for example, in the area, one of the reasons that um, drugs uh, such as cancer drugs and also psychiatric drugs 
one of the reasons that uh, they're notorious for failing in clinical trials is patient heterogeneity, that humans are widely different from each other. When these drugs are tested in animals, they're tested in genetically identical inbred mice. And after you run a clinical trial, in retrospect, you invariably find groups of populations that showed very robust responses and others that didn't respond at all. But when you average them all together, there's no statistically significant improvement from the placebo control group. And the FDA says thumbs down. Um, and it's, it's not adequate to go back and say, well, look, uh, this group here responded. So there must be something good about this. Um, but what machine learning has the potential to do is uh, by uh, being fed lots of high dimensional data sets collected from patient populations that have been run in preliminary clinical trials, genomics data, metabolomics data, physiological data, uh, lipidomics data, et cetera, um, uh, it, and then being given training data on which patients appeared to show a response to a drug and which patients didn't, um, it may be able to train itself to prospectively predict from a larger population of prospective patients for a clinical trial, the, the patients that are likely to respond to the drug based on the profile of all of these uh, metadata, high dimensional metadata that you can collect. And that's without knowing anything about uh, uh, how the drug works, why the drug works, uh, et cetera. So it's both miraculous uh, and very exciting, um, but at some level, a little discouraging uh, for us basic scientists. But you know, I've always felt very uh, defensive about the idea that the only justification for biology is that it is a technology in the service of medicine. Sure. I mean, yes, we would all love our discoveries mm -hmm. to be able to cure some disease. Uh, my father died a horrible slow death from Parkinson's disease about a year ago. And believe me, if I could think of a good experiment to do to cure Parkinson's disease, I would be doing it now. I would have been doing it eight months ago, but it's too complicated and I can't, and there's plenty, anything I can think of has been thought of by 50 other people. Um, yet no one has that expert expectation of astronomy or astrophysics. Nobody is asking LIGO to cure a human disease. No one is asking what LIGO or what the, uh, uh, the space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, is going to do to improve the human condition. It's, it's sort of like art. You look at it and you're in awe of the beauty uh, and the complexity of what you're seeing. And I think that biological systems, and in particular neural systems, are every bit as beautiful and complicated as something out in the cosmos and basic discoveries about how they work and what they mean should be given as much value as what they can do uh, for the betterment of the human condition, at least in the short term. Well but said. most of the world doesn't agree with me. <laughs> David, beyond the obvious burdens to your time in directing the Chen Institute, has it changed your research at all? Has it given you a wider vantage point that has prompted new approaches or at least new questions to things that you were already working on? Um, I wouldn't say that it has done that um, at this point. I mean, my research has broadened to incorporate more computational approaches um, we have a paper coming out in Cell early in January describing uh, the first observation uh, of a, a neural circuit that shows line attractor dynamics, which is a property of dynamical systems in the hypothalamus uh, region of the brain where nobody expected to see such kinds of fancy dynamic control uh, of neural coding. But that happened because I was fortunate enough to recruit a, a theory postdoc to my lab and uh, a brilliant CNS 
student who's a computational person, um, not uh, as a result of having been the director of the Chen Institute. I think what I've gotten from the Chen Institute um, is, is really um, more just shepping nachis. It's being, feeling good about giving money out to people. Uh, we just announced today the latest round of, uh, uh, of Chen grants, and we gave out over half a million dollars to 10 or 11 laboratories on campus. Most of the grants are about $50,000 each. And since the inception of the Chen grant program, uh, we've given out two and a half million dollars just in these grants. And that doesn't count the money that the Chen Institute has spent on supporting graduate fellowships, retreats, symposia, workshops, socials, other things. And, and so to be able to be part of something that I think and hope is having such a positive impact on neuroscience research and the neuroscience community at Caltech um, is enough of a reward for me. And if, you know, something that comes out of that uh, changes uh, over the longer term, changes my research approach, maybe it's certainly been great that Pietro Perona yeah. is now yeah. two offices away from me in the same building on the same floor and not across campus in the Moore building while I was over in church and alleys because uh, I can walk over and hock him at Chinik whenever I want to, whenever he's on campus and, uh, uh, and talk to him. And I think that, and the people in our labs, which are next door to each other, interact with each other spontaneously. And that's something that would not have happened without the Chen building. Uh, and Ralph Adolphs is next to me as well, and that's also been good. So I think the building has certainly had a positive um, influence in that respect. But uh, I think it's Caltech that, and the experience of being at Caltech that ha has put, driven me in this more computational direction, even though I don't pretend to be a computational person. But if I had taken a job at uh, UC San Francisco in the medical school, um, I would never have been working in an area like this. And it's because of exposure to people like Pietro uh, and others in the computational neuroscience, Doris Chow, when she was here, uh, that I've been pushed in that direction. So that that's really my, I would say that's my most recent reinvention, if you want to call it a reinvention, although it's not quite fair since I'm really totally dependent on other people to do the heavy lifting there. I, I have a good intuition um, and, and a heuristic understanding of what we are doing, but I couldn't sit down at the computer and go through the code and calculate all the results and, and explain to you every single equation um, we rely on our collaborators for that. But uh, that's from being at Caltech, where in the end, I think most people um, just care about numbers. Now, in light of all of these advances, both tangible and intangible, can you conceive of a follow-on conversation with the Chens and making the case, look at all we've done, would you consider coming back for a second round of support? At this point, no. I think uh, at this point, certainly not for a major gift. I think they've they've made the most generous gift of any gift that they've made to neuroscience philanthropy in the United States so far. Um, they are happy with us. They indicated that by a uh, a gift of one and a half million dollars last year on the occasion of the fifth year anniversary of the Chen Institute. And that was specifically to start a new program, a sort of workshop or boot camp in computational methods in neuroscience of the type we've been discussing for people who come from a non-computational background in cellular and molecular biology uh, and other fields and anatomy, other fields that are critical to neuroscience. And we managed to pull off the first, uh, uh, the, the first uh, case of that or the first course this past summer um, at the Chen's property 
in San Marino, which they very generously let us use for that purpose. So I think small, small gifts, maybe from time to time, um, but uh, I think uh, something major they will either do at another university or uh, in uh, somewhere in China is my bet. David, tell me about the book, The Neuroscience of Emotion, how you got to work with Ralph Adolphs. Uh, oh, how I got to work with Ralph Adolphs um, is that uh, Ralph and I uh, had known each other for a long time. Ralph was a student here when I first joined the faculty. Ralph and I taught at one point a, uh, a hundred level course for undergraduates and graduates on the neuroscience of emotion. Uh, and we uh, had discussed this idea of emotion primitives and uh, I had um, uh, co-authored with Ralph a perspective piece that was published in Cell, I think in 2014. 2014 was really my uh, anno mirabilis in terms of important publications. Um, and, and that sort of set the stage for the content of the neuroscience of emotion, except it focused on what animal models can tell us about emotion uh, less than it did on humans. And then Ralph approached me and asked me if I would co-author this book with him uh, on the neuroscience of emotion. And I really didn't want to do it but I sort of felt a moral obligation to do it because Ralph had been really helpful with the cell perspective piece that we wrote. And I know that in Ralph's field, people publish books as one of their main types of academic output, which is not something that is characteristic in cell and molecular and, and uh, developmental biology. Um, people don't um, people don't build their reputations on published books. They build them on publishing papers in Nature, Science, and Cell, and other high-profile journals. Um, and it was a daunting task. Um, and uh, I I certainly regretted many times when I was in it having agreed to do it. But I was pretty happy with the outcome, and that was largely due to Ralph. Ralph drove the entire process. He negotiated with the publisher. Uh, he was the one that ran interference with the editor. All I had to do was write chapters and read his chapters uh, and do edits. And it was pretty straightforward. It was nowhere near as burden burdensome and ultimately as unsatisfying as the second book that I wrote, which was, which I wrote uh, solo, but uh, you live and learn. You enjoyed, though, the science communication aspect, writing for a broader audience. I did enjoy it. I don't think I reached the audience that I wanted to reach, even though I thought I was doing my best to make something uh, accessible. Um, but I really um, misjudged what people are interested in um, when it comes to neuroscience, uh, which is they want to know about what are the prospects for curing Alzheimer's and depression. Um, and I talk a lot about, uh, some about curing depression in the last chapter of the book, but mostly it's about basic science. And the other thing is that people want self-help advice. Yeah. They want self-help advice. So um, I just just to make clear how how uh, painfully obvious the distinction is. Uh, there's a colleague of mine uh, at Stanford, a neuroscientist named Andrew Huber, who started doing a podcast uh, in 2021 during the pandemic, um, on which he interviewed neuroscientists and. Uh, uh, for you know, extended interviews for an hour and a half and put them up on the web. Uh, and he interviewed me about six months ago. And um, he has 
almost 1.9 million followers on the web, on YouTube or on Twitter. And if you look now, as you scroll through what the subjects of the podcasts are, yes, there are some basic science ones like mine, but there are a lot that are about self-help and they're increasingly part of self-help. And he sells supplements on his podcast. So 1.9 million followers, okay? If you go on Amazon and you look how many reviews I have of my book, 23, okay? <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> Don't sell out, David. You 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 have to continue being you. Well, I didn't write the book to make money for sure, but I did hope I would reach a broader audience. And I mean, even Romans doesn't carry it. I think they had two copies uh, and they sold two copies and that's it. But that's pretty depressing when your local bookstore doesn't even carry copies of your book. But it is what it is. Um, it was an important exercise for me. Uh, it was humbling and informative, as all good learning experiences should be. And I don't know whether I'll ever write another book again, um, but I certainly won't underestimate the difficulty in writing a book by yourself, but also in what it takes to really reach a broad audience. To go back to your comfort zone, a year later, you were a co-author on the paper, Computational Neuroethology, A Call to Action. It's relatively recent, but are you seeing reverberations, the call to action that you you you, 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 you called for? Are things moving in the right direction for neuroethology? Oh, yeah. that, that started, uh, the, the precursor to that article was the, uh, was the article on computational ethology that I wrote with Pietro in Neuron mm -hmm. in 2014. Right. Uh, that's why Pietro and I were invited to be uh, co-authors. I guess we were the graybeards <clears throat> on that paper. That field has exploded. Um, I wish I could say that uh, Caltech has maintained the leadership in that field that it started on initially. Um, but as often happens, it's the students that we trained here who have gone off and made uh, major contributions uh, in, as you know, postdocs or graduate students and now uh, in their own labs. Uh, so that has become a, uh, I think, a thriving uh, and vibrant field. Still one that, I mean, we're not talking the scale of cancer research or, you know, single cell RNA-seq. It's still a sort of niche mm -hmm. area uh, of neuroscience. Um, but, but I do think that um, the early efforts, particularly the ones in Michael Dickinson's lab, uh, the work that his trainees have done, uh, the work that Pietro's trainees have done uh, in in other institutions, um, and and some of our joint trainees has really uh, uh, paid off. Moving closer to the present, when COVID hit, people had to work remotely, both in leading Chen and for your own lab. What were some of the major challenges just to keep things going where there's a physical presence that's required? Um, the first and biggest challenge was. Uh, particularly during the shutdown, to uh, try to stop my students and postdocs from going into a deep depression, mm -hmm. because many of them uh, live alone and they don't have families and they were locked in their apartments for three and a half months. They couldn't come in to the lab. And so we uh, I instituted um, coffee meetings uh, initially three times a week and Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings um, to just talk about the pandemic, to talk about science. Um, we continued to have lab meetings as people sort of got into the, uh, the groove of analyzing data that they had already collected before the pandemic and presenting that to talk about. I think mentoring rotation students and new postdocs coming to the lab was a real difficulty when they showed up at the time 
that the lockdown occurred and through the ensuing year. And I lost one very good postdoc, uh, and I lost another graduate student who eventually left Caltech to go to uh, Columbia and Harvard, respectively, um, just because they could not build up enough momentum to get their projects going. And the first few, the first six months of a postdoc or a graduate school are really critical in getting people on their flight path uh, and getting them launched into a program. So that was really quite difficult. Uh, it was also challenging in the Chen Institute to maintain functions of various kinds. We, uh, Mary Sakura, my executive director, and Helen O'Connor, her assistant, did a fantastic job. We had uh, a virtual retreat one year where they used software that allows you to have a little avatar that you can move with your mouse that goes to visit various posters. And then you're in a little chat room where you can hear one student's poster and then you can go visit another one. And then you can meet with somebody else in another chat room to talk. It's not the same as being in person, but uh, it, it certainly um, helped with that aspect. I think uh, we really, Caltech, like every institution, lost a lot of its sense of community during uh, the COVID pandemic. And we're still not fully recovered. And already COVID cases are starting to spike again. Um, and that's really too bad. And it hasn't, it, I have to say, it hasn't really recovered in my lab yet. Uh, um, it's in part that I think reflects the habit that people got into of having to work in shifts. You know, we were only allowed to have, when we did go back to the lab, we could only have so many people in the lab at, at a particular time to maintain a certain low density, minimize contact. And so people got in the habit of coming in, doing their work for four hours, and then going home. And if they had um, data to analyze, they would do that at home. That's not what makes science fun. Yeah. What makes science fun and what makes running a lab fun is having a place where people hang out. They don't work nine to five schedules and then just go home and the rest of the time you can't talk to them because they're uh, focused on their experiments. Um, it, it's a place where uh, people hang out and you can have informal discussions. Uh, and that's where the creative juices uh, really start to flow. And that certainly has not uh, returned to its pre-pandemic level in my lab. I don't know if the same is true uh, for other labs, but I think that is, uh, that's, that's been a casualty of the pandemic uh, as it affects science. Um, there was a period uh, during the, the, the other major challenge was trying to recruit people to my lab. Basically, for the first year or so of the pandemic, or year and a half, I had no postdoc applicants. And I used to get multiple postdoc applicants every week, particularly when I was working in stem cells. It was a hot area. Uh, and I thought, okay, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm going to have to close my lab down. No one thinks what I'm doing is interesting anymore until I learned from other colleagues that nationally there is a postdoc crisis, which has been engendered in large part by the pandemic. Yeah. Um, people have reassessed their priorities. And just like we have the great resignation uh, in people who are uh, working outside of science, a lot of people who were uh, getting PhDs have decided it wasn't worth it for them to spend another six or seven years working for a relatively small salary in the hopes that they could apply for an academic job that had 350 other people applying for the same job. Um, and, and so uh, the postdoc market has dried up. Fortunately, beginning last March, uh, for me, it picked up again and I have uh, five new postdocs coming to my lab, which is good, although my lab is still much smaller 
than it has been in the past, which I actually don't mind because um, uh, in an effort to try to increase postdoctoral recruitment uh, and, and salaries in general for young people, the state of Pasadena, the state of California mandated uh, an increase in the minimum postdoc starting postdoc salary to uh, about $65,000 a year at a time when even NIH, and I think this is still true, their minimum starting salary uh, is $54,000. Um, and uh, when I uh, uh, when I was a postdoc, I got I got paid seventeen thousand dollars a year, which is equivalent to about thirty five thousand dollars a year in um, uh, uh, twenty twenty two dollars. But what that means is my grants have not gone up. By no one's grants have gone up um, by fifty uh, percent, and so we simply can't afford to have as many postdocs as we could, um, which I think is good fewer projects to think about, and um, you can think more deeply about each project. And maybe that's uh, that's a better way to go. Although I still do have now, I will have by the summer, 10 postdocs and five students or so in my lab, assuming I don't take any more students, which is plenty. David, the cultural impact of COVID, of just not being in the lab, being in person, that's where the magic happens. Are you concerned that this is a, a long-term effect that whenever COVID leaves, that, that, that science, that the culture of labs will retain this remote feel to them? Um, I think that that will depend on the culture of each individual lab and also the culture of the labs that are surrounding them. Uh, one of the things that... Um, has always been a challenge for me at Caltech compared to uh, Columbia, for example, is that Caltech is what I call has a suburban culture and Columbia Medical School has an urban culture in the labs, meaning the labs are large, people are spread out at Caltech. So the interaction frequency, the spontaneous frequency of bumping into somebody is lower at Caltech than it is at a place like Columbia, where people are used to be at least jammed on top of each other at a much higher density. Uh, and that's true for individual labs. It's also true for labs that are in the same building. They tend to stay separated from each other. So even before the pandemic, I think Caltech or certain parts of Caltech, at least the parts uh, where my lab was situated uh, didn't have the same level of energy and uh, um, uh, human interaction that uh, a more densely crowded environment would have. And I think that's the kind, when it's in that state where it's sort of tenuous to begin with, um, it makes it even harder to come back from something like COVID. So maybe at places like UCSF, where um, it's different uh, and more crowded, uh, an urban lab, maybe there it will come back. But I have to say, in talking to my colleagues, it's almost universal perception that uh, the, the postdocs and graduate students have really changed in the way that they <clears throat> view their what is fashionable to call now work-life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I was in graduate school, I had no work-life balance. I had work. I mean, maybe I went out on a date once in a while. Um, and that's how I expected. And the same thing was true when I was a postdoc uh, until I got married. And that's part of what made the kind of atmosphere that there was in the lab is that people were there all the time. People were there 12, 14 hours a day. Um, now there's a lot, plenty of people in my lab who are here for eight hours a day, uh, nine hours a day. Some, some work harder, but it's not the critical mass that you need to produce that sort of hopping atmosphere. I think people are, stu students and postdocs are having children, families later, uh, sorry, earlier, much earlier than in my generation. Uh, and once you have kids, 
then you get involved in picking them up from daycare and school and that also cuts down on the amount of time spent in the laboratory so i think things have already been trending in that direction of the lab being a place that you work rather than a place where you live mm -hmm. and happen to work as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and i don't see that um recovering getting any better uh after covid um for what it's worth and i i miss that to some extent um but uh i know a lot of people don't share my old-fashioned perspective uh on this and maybe it is healthier for people to have for students and postdocs to have a better work-life balance but science remains very competitive. And the people that have done the best in my lab are the people who have worked the longest hours in the lab. No question about it. It's just, it's, 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 it's an experimental science. It's not theoretical physics. And you just have to be there doing the experiments in order to make sure that eventually enough experiments work that your project succeeds. And that means being there a long time. And that means having time to bullshit with people while your experiments are running or you're waiting for samples to come out uh, of a, a measurement device. And that's what created this sort of generative atmosphere that uh, I miss and which you know may exist in other places and maybe it does exist in other labs on caltech campus i don't know what your experience is from talking to people here but um i think it's not just me that is noticing this it's about the grind it's not the genius that's what really gets the work done yeah yeah it's as they say it's a uh one percent inspiration and 90 percent perspiration David, to bring the story right up to the present yeah. on a scientific note, tell me about some of your recent work on neuropeptides and what might be patentable about this, what the IP angle is there. Yeah, so um, basically uh, I mentioned that we discovered that this family of neuropeptides, the tachykinins, um, is elevated uh, during social isolation in mice and that remarkably all of the long lasting adverse effects of social isolation in mice, which include increased aggression, increased fear, increased anxiety, all of those can be eliminated by treatment with a drug that blocks the action of one of these tachykinins. It's called tachykinin two or neurokinin B in mice. Uh, has a slightly different name in humans. And moreover, we can actually mimic the effect of social isolation in a non-isolated mouse by forcing its tachykinin neurons to fire more and to release more tachykinin peptide when they do fire. We do that by genetically engineering them. So that says that the increase in tachykinin release is really causal to the effect of social isolation to uh, uh, have all of these behavioral sequelae. And so we, fi we followed, filed two patents on that. Um, one patent, which uh, I think has been issued, uh, is mainly a patent that uh, uh, proposes a method for uh, modifying neuropeptide release in a subject by combining these two manipulations that we performed in mice, both an increase in the electrical activity of the neuron and an increase in the amount of the neuropeptide. So it's like you both have to fill the balloon with more water, but that won't help if you don't open up the nozzle to let the extra water out. You have to open the nozzle more, and that's where the increased activity 
comes from. Now, you might not want to do that for a neuropeptide like tachykinin that promotes a negatively valenced internal state, but you might want to do that for neuropeptides like endorphins and enkephalins that produce positively valent states and that have an analgesic action. Um, and that's, again, this is very long term and it will require combining this with the type of technology that Viviana Gradinaru uh, and Paul Patterson developed at Caltech uh, for getting viruses that carry these genetic payloads that allow you to fill up the water balloon and open the nozzle wider uh, by crossing the blood brain barrier so that you don't have to drill holes in the head and stick needles into your brain, but you can just give somebody an injection. Uh, so that's one patent. The second patent, which I am, I think is close to being issued, but I'm not sure because we've had a lot more trouble with it, is a use patent of tachykinin inhibitors, tachykinin receptor inhibitors to treat stress, anxiety, fear, aggressiveness brought on by social isolation. And the importance of social, uh, social interaction and the detrimental effects of social isolation were, of course, very apparent during the COVID pandemic. And uh, um, tachykinin antagonists uh, are being tested for other uses. For example, they're being tested for their ability to uh, um, mitigate hot flashes in perimenopausal women, um, which is a totally unrelated um, field of use. So this would be a field of use patent. But um, we're actively, we, I and some of my young colleagues who were involved in that story have been thinking about ways in which we could um, persuade investors to fund some sort of a startup that would allow us to develop these applications. Um, uh, uh, and, and one, one idea, um, that, that we've been pursuing, um, that I came up with is rather than trying to persuade somebody to go right into humans, um, uh, what about using developing veterinary medicine applications of this? Because after all, it does work in mice. And we know that during the COVID pandemic again, there was a huge increase in the acquisition of domestic dogs and cats. I think something like 23 million dogs and cats, or maybe it's just dogs, were uh, purchased over the pandemic. And now as people are going back to work and leaving their pets at home all day, there is a huge epidemic of separation anxiety among uh, cats and dogs. And because they've grown attached to their owners who've been home all day and all night, every day during the pandemic, and now certainly they're left alone. And the idea is that maybe the, uh, the bar for testing these drugs in domestic pets should be lower than in going to humans, because after all, cats and dogs are evolutionarily closer to mice than they are to humans. In fact, we've even been, I've even been approached by somebody who wants the test to test these drugs in domestic pigs, because apparently uh, a social isolation induced aggression is a serious problem in pig farming uh, for the females in particular. And so one idea is that uh, if we were able to get somebody to test these drugs uh, on animals uh, and they were successful, that could be a stepping stone for convincing investors that look, look how well it works, not just in mice, but in cats and dogs, and maybe even in pigs, which are so close to people physiologically that people are transplanting pig hearts, pig valves, uh, heart valves, and other things into humans all the time. Maybe that would convince them uh, to 
uh, fund another shot at uh, testing these drugs um, for their efficacy in psychiatric disorders. So those are the patents that we have. There's nothing like the raft of patents that my lab produced in the in the 90s the, uh, uh, and the 2000s, uh, where where we had many many patents relating to composition of matter for stem cells and angiogenesis of arteries and veins, none of which I have to say amounted to anything in terms of uh, being turned into a product. I mean, they helped get biotech companies started in which I participated, but that was biotech, none of those biotech companies were successful ultimately. Um, so uh, patents are a double-edged sword. They, you know, they can be useful, but they cost a lot of money to prosecute. They cost the university a lot of money. The university has been gotten much more uh, conservative about what inventions uh, they encourage patenting. And my lab's a basic research lab. We're not a technology development um, lab. There is an additional patent disclosure we're putting together on a method we did develop to measure the release of neuropeptides from neurons in real time, which is a method that has been lacking and could be used to develop a drug screening platform to find new drugs that affect the release of various peptides. So I certainly remain convinced that therapeutics, particularly for psychiatric disorders and pain that are based on neuropeptides are an untapped resource and that the death of that approach in 2010, roughly, um, has been premature and that there's room both to develop new drugs and also to rescue abandoned drugs that are sitting on the slag heap of uh, failed pharmaceuticals uh, that didn't make it through clinical trials, but which might be repurposed for indications that were not obvious uh, at the time that the drugs were originally developed and tested. But uh, who knows? David, now that we've worked right up to the present for the yeah. last part of our talk to wrap up this excellent series of conversations, a few retrospective questions about your career, yeah. then we'll end looking to the future. So to go back to this 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 point you made, this sharp point that you made about, you know, nobody asks an astrophysicist about the beauty that they've uncovered in the universe and how that might improve the human condition. If you can reflect on all of your work in biology broadly conceived, where do you derive the most satisfaction exactly on that point in elucidating that beauty in seeing something deeper that gave you that satisfaction totally divorced from translational pressures that society might impose on biology? Yeah, I, I think uh, the pleasure of figuring out how something works, which is, I think, a paraphrase of something Feynman once said, uh, and also in biology of seeing how things are organized and built, uh, particularly um, when there is a relationship between structure and function. I'm thinking of our work discovering uh, that arteries and veins are genetically distinct from before heartbeat. Uh, and, and that discovery making something that was previously invisible suddenly visible, making a latent type of organization or specificity patent uh, is part of what I find beautiful in, in biology. Um, and I think that's been harder in neuroscience, although the fact that we can trigger or inhibit aggression or fear or mating in mice or in flies, literally with the push of a button on a laser is uh, pretty remarkable, I think. And also to me, it, it has that um, beauty in that we understand the brain at least enough to be able to manipulate very basic survival 
instinctive behaviors in a very precise and reproducible way. Um, and so that uh, that is, uh, I think, some of the the places where um, there there is beauty. I tried to communicate some of that um, in my book, um, but it, it's it's when when you've got an experiment, a result that really carves nature at its joints as I forget who was responsible for saying it, and something suddenly something that was fuzzy and ill-defined becomes crisply defined. Like, how do arteries and veins get different from each other? How does the same, what seems to be the same group of cells in the female hypothalamus tell the female mouse whether when a male comes into her room, she should attack it or have sex with it, uh, where we've gotten very clear uh, and beautiful answers to those things. Um, that and and um, I think a lot of the fly work, again, the fact that we've I, I, we have identified a single neuron in the brain of a fly, one neuron that's present in both males and females, and activating that neuron is sufficient to trigger aggression in both sexes. And that's the first example of a cell that's common to both sexes that controls aggression. Even though male and female flies fight completely differently, this says that there is some common underpinning to aggression across sexes. I, I think those things uh, stand out in my mind um, as as being particularly um, beautiful. David, a counterfactual question, reflecting on your life at Caltech, the dramatic pivot in your research at the turn of the century, how inherently is that a Caltech story? In other words, in a parallel universe, if you were at a Harvard or a Stanford, would you have embraced something like you did at Caltech, do you think? I think probably not. And my two biggest inspirations for that were Seymour, who switched uh, in the 60s from working on cracking the genetic code, which was the problem of the moment in biology and to which he made fundamental contributions, to trying to discover a model organism that could be used to understand how genes control behavior. Um, that was a major shift and Seymour has long been a hero for doing that. And then more recently, Elliot Meyerowitz's pivot from working on the control of glue gene expression in fruit fly salivary glands to basically creating a field of plant genetics uh, and understanding pattern formation and differentiation in flowering plants. Those are really my two uh, inspirations. And I guess on the non-scientific side, uh, another inspiration is Bob Dylan. Um, as, a, as an acoustic guitarist, uh, I understand why so many people were pissed at Bob Dylan when he went electric, <laughs> but uh, he's somebody that's constantly reinvented himself. And I'm not trying to compare myself in science to Bob Dylan, but it's people that are not afraid to leave their comfort zone and try something different and reinvent themselves that are the, uh, the inspiration for me. That fantastic joke that you shared when you got to Caltech and biology was understood to be a humanities because of its lack of, of, of equations. Has that culture changed at all at Caltech or is it still more or less what it was like? I think the culture still exists in pockets and but that people are less ready to say that in much the same way that sexism and racism still exists in pockets 
at Caltech and anti-Semitism, but people are less willing uh, to say that. Um, but I do think that there has been uh, a, a huge diffusion into the rest of the Institute of biological problems uh, as worthy of study by people in other divisions, and largely because of the impact of big data and the need for computational tools and approaches to understand uh, big data and make sense of the overwhelming complexity uh, of biology. And that, that I think there is some respect, maybe finally, for the fact that biological problems take a long time to solve, not because they're being worked on by biologists rather than physicists, and biologists are inherently less smart than physicists, but actually because the problems are a lot more complicated than a lot of the problems that have been solved by physics uh, over the last several centuries. Um, biology, in general, solutions, and, and you can correct me because you're a physicist, but in general, the solutions to problems in physics that are the right solutions are often the simplest ones, and they have symmetry and beauty to them. And with the exception of the few rare cases I mentioned a moment ago, solutions in biology tend to be Baroque, unnecessarily complicated, Rube Goldberg-like machines that no engineer interested in efficiency would ever have dreamed of putting together. And that's because biological systems on our planet evolved and everything is a consequence of the sequence in which things evolved. And just as I gave the example of how the experimental system, fruit flies, which at one point in the evolution of my science seemed like the bee's knees and the best way system to approach the problem, 10 years later, things change and it's no longer the best approach for certain kinds of questions. Certainly in evolution, some of the first strategies that evolved to allow organisms to cope no longer were the most efficient ways to do things as life evolved and new challenges were faced by organisms and new functions had to be involved. They adapted. They were all constrained by what came before. And uh, it, it's, I mean, it's great that there is a systems biology and that people like Michael Elowitz are thinking about these issues in a sort of top-down sort of way to try to simplify them. But the fact is that uh, biological systems are hard to solve because they are so complicated. And that's why we've been banging away at cancer for decades, and we still don't have a universal cure for cancer, although we've made great strides. And we've been banging away at the brain for a century, and we still don't have even a reliable diagnosis for Alzheimer's, let alone a treatment or a cure. And the same thing for Parkinson's. Uh, and we have drugs for depression, but we have no idea how they work and why they work and why they work for some people and not others. Um, it's, it's not because biologists are just not smart enough and quantitative enough to be able to solve these problems, which I think was the a popular trope among physicists, certainly when I was growing up. Uh, and I say that having grown up as the son of a theoretical astrophysicist. Um, but uh, I think that 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 has changed and that I hope that there is certainly at least an increasing respect for biology and biological problems as challenging important problems that are worthy of being solved.
among the people, the physical scientists who dominate the Caltech environment intellectually, administratively, numerically, um, but also perhaps maybe a grudging increase in respect for biologists uh, as, as um, people who uh, are not doing biology because it's easier than physics, but because they want to solve what are hard and important and complicated problems. David, we'll end looking to the future. So first, just a prosaic question. Do you have a sense of when you might step down from leading the Chen Institute? Or is it more, if you're having fun, if it's intellectually stimulating, you'll just keep at it for as long as you want? Uh, no, I think I should probably step down after my next term. I can't, I, I can't remember. It's a, I think it's a five-year term. I think it's important to have a different person with a different set of interests and views um, running the Chen Institute. Uh, it may be that that's also around the time I decide to retire or at least to close my lab. I've started to think about that. Um, uh, an interesting generational thing is that when I got to Caltech, there were people here who were running their labs full blast well into their mid 80s. People like Seymour Benzer, people like Norman Davidson, Ed Lewis. Uh, it was not uncommon to have op octogenarians here running full blown laboratories. And I'm not, well, I'm not an octogenarian yet, but what I am seeing is people in my generation already having closed their labs. People at Stanford, people at Berkeley, people at Genelia, uh, for whatever reason. I think part of the reason is that uh, running a lab, particularly a big lab in this day and age, is a stressful occupation. It is very stressful. And uh, the older you get, the more that stress wears on you. And stress is, of course, counterproductive to anything creative that you want to do. I mean, maybe a little stress is good, but not too much. And uh, there's more than there should be in science. So that's uh, that has certainly uh, a different uh, a different aspect of it. Now I've lost the thread of what your question was. Sorry. Just just about the plan of of, of of when you might step down. Yeah. So I would say certainly five years uh, uh, to step down from the head of the Chen Institute, um, if not sooner. I mean, I I have to say I I'm enjoying being the head of the Chen Institute, A, because I have Mary Sakura and Helen O'Connor, who were just absolutely fantastic um, doing all of the heavy lifting and organizations. And I just have to come up with ideas or bring them other people's ideas and they implement and they get it done. Uh, uh, Mary is very rare in her abilities uh, to do that. Um, and I enjoy um, giving people money. I mean, it's certainly true that no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and, uh, and I have and will continue to take a certain amount of, of shit um, for um, the way that I run the Chen Institute. Um, but in the end, I think it's a net benefit. I mean, half a million dollars a year in grant support. And uh, um, if you consider that it uh, would take a million dollar endowment uh, minimum to support a graduate student for one year that, uh, and we give out six fellowships or so, six or seven fellowships every year, that's another six or seven million dollars going into uh, uh, support for graduate students. So I, I think I would like to think it would have uh, an impact on the neuroscience community, um, but that's a challenge because the neuroscience community 
here as it is everywhere is very diverse and people have very strong opinions about how they think the brain should and shouldn't be studied. Um, hopefully we can get them all together uh, in, at our retreats to argue with each other and debate these issues and maybe something good uh, will uh, come out of that. Um, but certainly as a place that does not have a neuroscience department, unlike many of our competitor institutions, uh, MIT has a Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, Stanford has a Department of Neurosciences. UC San Diego, Columbia, you know, many of our top competitors, especially those with medical schools, have departments of neuroscience. But that's just the way Caltech is set up. Uh, so I hope, I, I hope we can fill some of that uh, gap in in community building here. So. You know, until it becomes, until I feel like it's really interfering with my ability to do science um, and do the rest of my job, um, I will continue to keep doing it as long as they will have me. And it's I'm learning something about being in an administrative position without having to deal with the kind of headaches that come along for the ride with being a division chair, which is something I would never want to do. And, and um, so uh, I certainly learned that. Finally, David, we'll end on the science, particularly in light of the timing where you might co-time stepping down from leading the Chen Institute to winding down your lab. So for whatever that chronology looks like, five, six, seven years, whatever it is, what are the most important things for you to focus on during that period? Yep. Um, that's that's actually um, become uh, uh, recently pretty well clarified in my mind, at least for now, uh, as a result of the computational approach that we have taken and this discovery of line attractor dynamics in the hypothalamus. Um, it raises all sorts of questions that are general to line attractors that have remained um, unanswered, like does the brain really use them to perform important behaviors? Um, what determines the cells that contribute to them? Are they influenced by experience, learning and memory, hormones, physiological state? Um, uh, all of those questions, I think, can be answered in over the next five years using the hypothalamus as a test bed. And beyond that, I think there's an even more ambitious goal, which um, uh, I think we may be able to get to in the hypothalamus, and that is to uh, understand how genes, cell types, neural circuits, and the emergent properties of neural circuits, like attractor dynamics, interact to cause changes in factors like hormones to change behavior. And I think some of our recent studies, particularly in female mice, where we've discovered what looks like evidence uh, that a line attractor forms and disappears in the same region of the brain as female mice go through the estrous cycle and transit from being sexually receptive to non-receptive um, is a place where we might be able to make that happen because we know some of the genes that are affected by sex hormones like estrogen. We've identified the cell types and changes in the cell types in that region that occur during the cycle. We're poised to try to figure out which of those cell types uh, contribute to line attractor dynamics and how they generate the slow dynamics that are required to generate line attractors, whether it's chemical, whether it's by a recurrent circuitry. And I think we might actually be able to start 
to achieve this vertical integration across levels of understanding and abstraction from genes to cells to circuits and synapses to population scale emergent properties all the way to behavior. Um, and if that's something that I could make a dent in um, in the next five or six years, I would be pretty happy. And I, I can sort of see a way to that, and I'm really excited about that right now. So I feel like we're full speed ahead. Of course, we're going to have competitors and people are going to swarm into this field. Um, but uh, I think we're in a very good position uh, to learn some very, very important things. That's one of the hardest problems, solving the vertical integration problem in neuroscience. I'll just state, uh, you know, editorially how heartwarming it is to hear the level of excitement. I mean, you kind of sound like a postdoc right now thinking about the next five yeah. years. Yeah, I mean, really, the only thing I want to do when I come in to the office is work on our next paper right now and go through the figures and make sure everything is right and uh, get it written up and uh, submit it and then start working on the next one. And there's fortunately, there's a next one coming down the line and there's a next one after that. And as long as the discoveries and the papers keep coming and I have something to tell the world about and I have great students that I can watch grow up and make these contributions, um, I'll continue to do this. David, this has been a terrific series of conversations. Thank you so much. I know how busy you are for spending all this time with me. It's a treasure for Caltech. It's a treasure for the history of biology. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your interest, David.